Uh, I'm David Schlossberg. I'm one of the co-directors of the new Sydney Environment Institute and a professor of environmental politics. Welcome to everyone. Um, so this is it. This is the official launch of the Sydney Environment Institute. Um, I'm incredibly proud of what we're constructing here in interdisciplinary environmental research at the University of Sydney, an institute that is focused on the changing and adapting uh, relationship with the non-human world. And I can think of absolutely no better way of kicking us off uh, than having Ian McCalman talk to us about his new passionate history of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, before we start up, I just want to thank, as always, Meredith Hall and Sydney Ideas. We've had a working relationship with Sydney Ideas um, since I arrived here three years ago, uh, and the Environment Institute is uh, looking forward um, to many more of these evenings where we engage with the public. Uh, so Ian, uh, the way the evening is going to go, Ian's going to talk mostly about the reef and the book, uh, but he's also going to talk a bit about the Institute uh, and our digital strategy. Uh, after that, we'll have about half an hour for a Q&A. We can talk about the book or the Institute. Um, and um, to start, though, uh, we're going to have Duncan Iveson, who's the Dean of Arts and Social Sciences and, appropriately, one of the earliest supporters of the Sydney Environment Institute. Um, come up and introduce Ian properly. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be here, and let me uh, add my acknowledgement of the traditional owners, the Gadigal, uh, here this evening. Um, it's great to see so many people here. There's seats down at the front. If you're looking for somewhere to sit, please come down and join us. Um, uh, how does one introduce uh, Ian McCalman? I mean, let me say, first of all, that uh, I'm very proud of the fact that the Institute is being launched tonight. I think it's the beginning of something distinctive and important at the University of Sydney. The University has been marshalling its resources over the past few years to address some of the big questions of the time through the combined intellectual resources and energy of our outstanding faculties. And I think the Institute, uh, the Sydney Environment Institute, is yet, yet another chapter in that very exciting story at the university. I really look forward to working with Ian and David uh, in, in, in promoting their program and doing the work that I know they're going to tell us more about uh, later on tonight. Well, it's tempting to say that Ian McCalman is, is a kind of force of nature himself um, when looking at uh, his profile. Uh, many of you, of course, will uh, know Ian from his last book, Darwin's Armada, which won uh, a swathe of prizes and was the basis of a TV series, Darwin's Brave New World. He's the fellow of three learned academies, a former president of the Australian Academy of Humanities and a very passionate defender of the humanities uh, in general and has continued to be long since stepping down from uh, that uh, formal role. He is indeed uh, a force for the humanities in more ways than one. He was director of the Humanities Research Institute Center at the ANU from 1995 and to 2002. He won the inaugural Vice Chancellor's Prize at the ANU for teaching excellence, so he brings the worlds of research and teaching together in, uh, with extraordinary uh, skill and, and passion. He is a former Federation Fellow, and luckily for us, he's currently a research press professor in the Department of History at the University of Sydney where he has been really an outstanding colleague for all of us in his time since we were able to persuade him to uh, leave the uh, sepulchral calm of Canberra and join uh, the bright lights of Sydney. Uh, and of course, now he's co-director with David of this exciting new venture, the Sydney Environment uh, Institute, which I should say is a genuine whole of university initiative, bringing together the humanities, the sciences, and the life sciences together to focus on this extraordinarily important issue. We, we live in a complex environmental system, but of course, humans live within, within that system, and the connection between meaning, value, and climate is absolutely central to sorting out how we'll adapt to the changes coming over the next decades. So Ian uh, is uh, also, uh, as David mentioned, uh, about to launch his new book, The Reef, A Passionate History, From Captain Cook to Climate Change, which will be published by Penguin in Australia in November uh, and in the USA in uh, May 2014. Uh, and tonight, he's going to talk to us about living in changing worlds. Ian.
Thank you, Duncan. That was a fantastic uh, introduction. I feel like just leaving now <laughs> before I disappoint you. Um, thank you for coming, and uh, thank you, David, for introducing us so nicely. So I want to begin um, by telling you about, uh, about my relationship to the Great Barrier Reef. The seeds of my urge to write a history of the Great Barrier Reef were sown back in 2001 when I naively embarked on a BBC television reenactment of Captain Cook's 1770 voyage through the reef to Indonesia. Well, the reef country was breathtakingly beautiful, but my voyage under simulated 18th century conditions proved brutal. A kind of big brother at sea reality show. We climbed swaying masts without safety harnesses to set thrashing sails in the dark. We chewed hardtack biscuits that broke our teeth and the teeth of the reef sharks we fed them to. Uh, and we were made to sleep in wet clothes so that one historian got double pneumonia and had to be dashed to hospital by helicopter. The resulting TV series, The Ship, was at best a mixed success. Even so, this media voyage did raise intriguing questions that have come to underpin my forthcoming book on the reef and its associated digital products. Well, from that endeavour voyage, I learned first that Cook and his crew had seen the reef as a freak of nature, uh, one that threatened to devour the sailors through shipwreck, drowning, starvation and savage spears. They'd called this vast country of coral the insane labyrinth because it reminded them of the Greek myth of Theseus being forced to thread his way through a maze where a man-eating monster, the Minotaur, lay in wait. Such a view of the reef was, of course, unthinkable to the 21st century volunteers aboard the Endeavour replica. My three Aboriginal messmates saw the reef as country, a heartland of deep spiritual and physical nurture, alive with rich means of succour and with the spiritual imprints of their ancestors everywhere around. Our romantic young volunteer crew, most of them from Britain and America, the TV audiences, regarded the Barrier Reef as a kind of modern day tourist paradise, a place of stunning beauty and sensual delights that brought a tan to their bodies and a salve to their souls. And the young biologist who escorted us around Lizard Island saw the reef as a fragile scientific wonder. Proud of the ec ecological work of the local research station, she nevertheless pointed out to us some startling examples of recent coral bleaching. The once dazzling corals now looked like skeletons in a war grave. I decided there and then that I would one day try to discover how and why such contradictory human images of the reef had come about. The voyage also drove home to me the power of visual media as a tool for historical research and communication. And this was true despite the fact that our hairy-chested director forced us to participate in what he called extreme history, a genre in which modern day volunteers are tested against simulated hardships and perils of the past. If he comes knocking, do not answer. But even the most alienated among us was struck by the power of documentary TV to capture dynamic natural environments, dangerous situations and strange encounters. My own historical theories about Cook and even my pathetic hissy fit personal mutiny were carried across the world to thousands of people of diverse ages, ethnicities and social backgrounds. For someone used to only reaching small, specialised audiences, it was an eye-opening experience. But when, around three and a half years ago, I at last began researching and writing a history of the Great Barrier Reef, I was shaken by new challenges that emerged from two directions. Since my earlier voyage, climate change had announced itself with a bang inaugurating arguably the greatest global crisis of our time. 
In the process, it brought the reef's very survival into question. Whether I liked it or not, planetary change was infusing my book with a contemporary urgency. Hence, I guess, a passionate history. I was now writing a human and a natural history of a global treasure that could soon be lost. If this wasn't bad enough, while I was writing, the century, centuries-old medium of print publishing began to collapse around me. Shaken by the reverberations of a worldwide revolution in digital communications, which is still, of course, being worked out. It's in its early days. I could feel the ice flows around me cracking underfoot and reforming in new shapes. Our entrenched print-based model of scholarly research and production was and is like the reef struggling to adapt or perish. A slew of academic and general publishers, journals and bookshops has gone out of business or been forced to go digital in the last three years. The very way we understand and communicate knowledge has transmuted. Let me say a little more about each of these challenges in turn. Coral reefs are in the vanguard of climate change because they are today's equivalent of the little canaries that 19th century coal miners carried to test for the presence of toxic gases. Australian scientists have, been, have led the way in discovering that a coral reef is perhaps the most sensitive of all organic barometers for registering the destructive effects of human-generated greenhouse gases. John Veron, always known by his childhood nickname of Charlie because of his resemblances to Darwin, is one of the foremost of these coral pioneers, and I want to talk a bit about his ideas. He was the first chief scientist of the Australian Institute of Marine Science, a winner of the celebrated Darwin Medal, a reef diver who's clocked up more than 7,000 hours underwater. Charlie is also the discoverer of over 20% of the world's existing corals. His many achievements include a searing book published by Harvard in 2008 called A Reef in Time, The Great Barrier Reef from Beginning to End. In it, Charlie argues that corals are both the canaries that foretell future environmental disasters and the historical archives that reveal the stories of previous catastrophes. Investigating coral reefs then forced Charlie to become a historian and a paleontologist, just as it has forced me to immerse myself in marine biology, geology and ecology. Charlie shows us how reef growing corals are peculiarly vulnerable to the effects of greenhouse gas pollution because it attacks them in multiple ways. They're already weakened by chemical pollutants and by declining fish stocks that can no longer check coral-eating predators like the crown of thorns starfish. But reef corals are now being subjected to immersion in waters that have warmed several degrees beyond their evolved tolerance. The consequences are quick and disastrous. The corals have to expel the tiny symbiotic algae that live, that live in their cells or die from excess oxygen poisoning. But these tiny algae are the solar panels that provide the coral polyps with their colour and with the energy necessary to lay down limestone like bone fast enough to resist the disintegrating effects of waves and of predators. So the divorce of this ancient partnership between plant and polyp is what leads to mass coral ble bleaching. And the bleached corals can't recover because episodes of water warming are becoming habitual. It's sort of almost an annual thing now. And if this isn't bad enough, all our oceans are absor absorbing CO2 
and methane to the point where their vast waters are starting to acidify. Within a few decades, this will reach a tipping point when, as with an antacid tablet, their waters have to dissolve calcium carbonate in, also, in order to balance the pH. Corals and other calcium-based creatures, including species basic to the food chain, like plankton and krill, are thus being inflicted with a deadly osteoporosis, one whose early effects are already evident. Their brittle, slower growing skeletons are finding it ever more difficult to resist the crushing power of the waves, especially as climate distorted weather whips up more and more powerful and more and more frequent cyclones. As well as this, global warming is melting the ice caps and causing sea levels to rise, which will further stress many reefs by depriving them. The water gets too deep. It deprives them of the light needed for their algae engines to photosynthesize and produce energy-enhancing fuel. Buffeted by so many destructive forces, what hope do coral reefs have? Charlie shows us that CO2 and methane poisoning from volcanoes, earthquakes and oceanic eruptions have featured in all but one of five recorded mass extinctions of reefs on our planet. And the new reefs took millions of years to grow. Chillingly, Charlie and most of his colleagues believe that these apocalyptic processes are already irreversible, even though their full impact is not yet evident. You can imagine how Charlie Veron, a passionate man, must have felt as he addressed a specially convened emergency meeting of the UK's Royal Society a few years ago. He was a man who'd spent most of his life celebrating the wondrous, wondrous multiplicity of corals, having to then prophesy their extinction. Yet rather than give up or lapse into fatalism, Charlie's gathered a huge collaboration of like-minded scientists, artists and illustrators to undertake an urgent mission of resurrection. Together they're producing a massive database, digital database, that chronicles and displays all the living corals of the world within underwater environments. In short, Charlie and his colleagues are recording and displaying everything that is known and seen about living corals today. Present and future generations who may no longer be able to swim with corals as we can do are being gifted with Charlie's knowledge through the infinite and instant reach of the World Wide Web. This act of what I see as a kind of global re-enlightenment is Charlie's constructive response to the challenge of climate change. Their database will, he hopes, enable resourceful humans of the future to restore, replicate or adapt the growth processes of coral reefs and corals that might otherwise be lost for centuries. A digital mission, then, is how Charlie is making the best of living in a cyclonically changing world. It's true that Charlie's digital mission could appear problematic to some of us insofar as it, as it is new digital forms of communication that most threaten traditional book and journal publishing. My own Australian publisher, Penguin, is in the process of amalgamating with the mass press Random House in an attempt to counter the threats posed by new model commercial rivals like Amazon and Book Depository. Mass digital depositories and publishing companies loom like global icebergs because they can undercut prices and deliver digital books cheaper and faster anywhere in the world than any national or local bookshop or publisher can achieve. Major bookseller chains like Borders, Barnes & Noble and Waterstones are crumpling under this competition. Editors and literary agents and publishers 
are also at risk. Some presses, including the University of Sydney, have of course wisely adapted to these changes by publishing in both digital and print-on-demand forms. Many scholarly journals too are trying to find new ways to survive in open source forms. Yet since most open source journals rely on shifting their production costs from reader to author, they're likely to bring us serious new problems as university researchers. Meanwhile, university libraries spend more on digital databases than on books, and university teachers are fast discovering that the majority of their knowledge of students comes from wikis, websites, chat lines, blogs, and social media. The great US environmental historian William Cronin tells a disquieting story in his recent retiring address as president of the American Historical Association. He'd not long before, he said, delivered a public lecture about his latest book in progress that had taken about 15 years to produce. And he was pleased when a student congratulated him afterwards. However, the student suddenly added rather wistfully, I'm sad that I will never get to read your book. I will eventually finish it, Bill replied defensively. Yes, said the student, but you said it would be 500 pages long. I have never read a non-fiction book that long, and I never will. Neither will anyone else that I know. So with these words ringing in my ears, as I contemplated my 400-page book on the reef, I decided to model myself on Charlie Veron and try to adapt positively to the digital deluge. In partnership with a filmmaker friend, Mike Blewett, and with the help of some modest startup funding from Screen Queensland, we began this process of adaptation by filming a short book trailer and TV promo to advertise the ideas of the book through digital outlets such as YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And I'd like to show you that tra trailer. It's only about three minutes long. A reef is not just a place, not just a collection of corals, not just a scientific phenomenon. It is a subjective experience, something that comes out of an engagement between the human and the place something that's part of the mind and the heart as much as it is the physical object. As a historian, I find it so strange that while we know a lot about the natural history of this beautiful place, its reefs, its sea creatures, its caves, we still know so very little about the human history of the reef. This book will take us across the length and breadth of the Great Barrier Reef to explore how humans, past and present, have shaped this marvellous global icon and also how Australia as a nation has been shaped by it. Well, Cook lucked out, didn't he? If he had landed on that other side, yeah. the story may have been different. Yeah, it was. It's a history found in some of the remotest places on Earth. This 14-year-old boy has been abandoned and he's in a place like he's never seen before. It is utterly vast. What we've been imagining is a myth the man who created that myth for the Great Barrier Reef was Ted Banfield. They see among the crowd of Aborigines on the shore a wild-looking, copper-coloured man. At once, they recognise him as a white man. And it's a history we almost never had. We nearly lost it to someone who wanted to mine it for oil and gas and it was only three concerned citizens who mobilised to save it at that point. On the face of it, 
Judith Wright and her colleagues were ill-qualified to fight this campaign. But they said, in effect, bugger that. These were the men and women, the Australians and the foreigners, the saints and the sinners, the scientists, artists and castaways who've shaped our ideas and our feelings about the greatest marine environment this planet has ever known. Writing the book, I also enlisted the expert help of a splendid local digital company, Spring in Alaska. I hope they might be here tonight. Um, and with assistance from the Australian Research Council in a linkage grant, we produced an educational website that is designed to serve as both a supplement and an alternative to the forthcoming Reef book. Um, um, can we show that website? Okay, and um, uh, to be blunt, I'm hoping that this punchy website, which it is when it's um, actually active, we've just taken a, a shot at the front of it then, will carry my ideas and concerns about the reef to audiences who now regard reading a large book, or perhaps any book, as unthinkable. The website contains three short documentary films which we made on key locations in the Great Barrier Reef, as well as interviews with indigenous knowledge custodians, archival photos, documents, discussions of the chapters and ideas and so on, and much else. By way of example, I'd like to show you the shortest of these films, which as it happens, is about Captain Cook. Over there lies the Great Barrier Reef, more than two and a half thousand kilometers of it. This vast living organism of coral reefs, of caves, and of islands was the home to multitudinous clans of indigenous people who lived up and down this coastline. They lived sometimes richly, sometimes precariously on the reef's bounty which they harvested and managed with a skill and subtlety it was incredible. But in May 1770, all this was about to change. It was then that the HMS Endeavour, a British naval bar captained by James Cook, sailed into the southern entrance of the reef. And it was then that the exclusive tenure of the indigenous people of the Great Barrier Reef came to an end. Thanks very much. Well, as will be obvious, I still have many digital skills to learn. Um, but I do believe that, with help, we can and must learn to work within these fast-evolving new digital habitats. And I must admit that catching the digital wave can be exhilarating at times, as well as bruising. Uh, embracing the digital can even improve uh, how we write. It opens up new ways of visual thinking, new structures of narrative and analysis, new visual tools, methods and data that enable fresh questions and fresh answers. And of course, going digital will, I hope, help to attract new audiences to our work. At least for the moment, too, it seems possible to function in tandem with the medium of print that Gutenberg gave us so long ago and that many of us still cherish. Of course, the ultimate purpose of this talk goes much beyond my personal challenges with the reef and the digital. My book and its digital offspring are merely examples, and I hope 
symbols of a much larger task that confronts us all in learning how to live with a world that is experiencing torrential change. Of course, we must fight to avert the destructive consequences of these changes. But where they cannot be stopped, we need to learn to adapt creatively and positively to the new conditions that they bring into being. This then is why Professor David Schlossberg and I, and a group of terrific colleagues from this university, many of whom are here in the audience, are today using this lecture to mark the advent of the new Sydney Environment Institute. The raison d'etre of this body is a simple phrase that heads this talk, living in changing worlds. We believe that the time is ripe for environmental researchers within this university and elsewhere, within many disciplines and many schools and faculties, to join forces and work out ways of adapting holistically to the environmental tempests that are crashing around us. We've been strongly supported in this mission by the university's uh, senior executive, and we thank them for this vote of confidence. It's also thanks in part to funding provided to us by the Andrew Mellon Foundation in the US that we're in the process of building a multi-stranded website which will use all the digital resources we can muster to develop national and international dialogues about the environment and take our scholarship out to the wider world. Ours is a federated network nourished from below and built on the energy, the scholarship and the enthusiasm of seven semi-autonomous research hubs drawn from multiple disciplines within the human, the natural and the technological sciences. We're project-centred and we aim to disseminate our research through print, film and the new communicative tools of the digital revolution. Our watchword is collaboration and we've been delighted at the collegial encouragement we've been offered by the university's key environmental leaders in the natural sciences, in agriculture and environment, and in the new Charles Perkins Centre. We're in the process, too, of talking with those in many other kindred fields, such as architecture, engineering, Chinese studies, robotics, law, and so on. Every discipline and faculty in the university is relevant to this mission and is in, as important in it. It's surely important that a whole of university contribution is made to showing how we can live positively in our changing world. I'd like to think that we can all work together symbiotically like those tiny corals and those algae engines that long ago joined forces to build the mightiest coral reef that our planet has ever known. Thank you very much. <laughs>